Welcome to this Battle of Ideas debate. What is wrong with men's rights? I'm Luke. I'm the chair for this discussion. I'm not going to speak for very long. All I'll say is that I'm generally someone who's quite sceptical of the whole idea of men's rights. Um, and having had a chat with uh, our panel this morning, we've got two speakers who are broadly critical of the men's rights movement and one who is broadly a proponent. But there is always, even for someone who's critical of the idea, there is some niggling problems that um, do present themselves. There is statistics which suggest that young men are falling behind in school and later in their professional life. There are issues with regards to equality uh, of the law uh, and men in the position of uh, challenging certain uh, legal decisions do face arguably disproportionate problems. So, I mean, even as someone who's broadly sceptical, I have some, uh, uh, some genuine concerns um, and obviously our speakers will be able to unpack these issues a lot more. So the first to speak will be uh, Lydia Smith. Lydia is a journalist for the International Business Times. She's a writer on human rights, health and gender. Thank you very much for being with us, Lydia. To my uh, right is Peter Lloyd. Uh, Peter is a freelance journalist, uh, appeared in numerous publications, and he's author of Stand By Your Manhood, uh, which is, as the title suggests, a sort of case to reclaim our masculinity, and he can explain a bit about what that means. And last to speak will be Angela Nagel. Uh, Angela is a cultural critic. She's the co-editor of a book, Island Under Austerity. And she's got a book coming out next year with zero books called Kill All Normies. And again, I have absolutely no idea what that means. And she, she can explain it if she so chooses. The panel are going to speak for about five minutes each. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions and then we'll come straight out to the audience because it's, it's the kind of discussion that's going to thrive from audience contributions, no doubt. Um, all right, uh, Lydia, do you want to get us underway? Yeah, thank you everybody for coming. So most of you will have heard of men's rights activists. You may have seen their websites, blogs, you may have seen them on Twitter, those who haven't been banned from Twitter, that is. You may have even seen some of them on TV or bought their books. So let me start by saying that men in Britain have problems. Boys underperform in education. 60,000 fewer men go to university each year than women. Our prison populations are overwhelmingly male. And suicide is, of course, the biggest killer of men, middle-aged men, in the UK. These are problems we need to address. But the problem is that men's rights don't address these issues. Its activism has the reach and the influence to help engineer actual change, but instead it exploits these issues for one aim, to fuel anti-women rhetoric. Instead of looking at the causes of poor education and unemployment, which include race, class, and the rigid constructs of masculinity, men's rights twist the talking points of women's rights to improve that men are in fact the more oppressed gender. For example, both men and women suffer domestic violence. But has the men's rights movement set up shelters for men? Have they called for government inquiries? Do they raise money for research to um, show the scope of violence against men? No, instead they spend their time trolling women to dispute the data about the scale of domestic violence that they face. That's not activism. In choosing to spew misogyny and hate rather than affect actual change, these keyboard crusaders are betraying the very people they claim to help, men. As a result, it falls to charities like Refuge, a domestic violence charity set up by women for women that actually set up services for men across the country. Historically, men's rights activism has always attacked women's rights. In 1926, the League for Men's Rights, set up in London, was founded with the goal of combating all excesses of women's emancipation. And I, I don't normally quote Urban Dictionary, but I feel like they hit the nail on the head with its description of meninism as a movement that claims to advocate men's rights, but fails to do so because they're too busy complaining about and harassing feminists. Every time I cover International Women's Day, it leads to men's rights activists asking why the same attention isn't given to International Men's Day. It's similar to the All Lives Matter response to Black Lives Matter. It misses the point entirely. Our society has always dictated that men are dominant. And if they aren't flourishing at work or have problems at home, this failure against the backdrop of male entitlement leads to anger. This anger is then directed at a perceived but non-existent threat, women. This ignores the fact that masculinity drives many of the problems women face, such as domestic violence. It's as harmful for men as it is for women. My final point is that while it's easy to laugh off men's rights, their anger towards women they promote is really dangerous. In 2014, a 22-year-old man called Elliot Rogers went on a shooting spree in California. He frequently visited men's rights website, and just before the shooting, he posted a video on YouTube which said, 
I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. There were obviously many, many reasons behind this horrendous incident, but undeniably one of them was his hatred of women, no doubt fueled by the men's rights websites that he visited. He felt entitled as a man to a woman, which combined with his isolation sparked anger. Not all men's rights activists are murderers, of course, but some are, and that's enough. The other danger of men's rights is how its activists minimize atrocities inflicted upon women. One website, A Voice for Men, openly advocates an end to rape and domestic violence hysteria. Paul Elam, its founder, once wrote an article about how drunk women were freaking begging to be raped. They perpetuate damaging myths, one of the most common being that women lie about sexual assault and therefore innocent men are wrongly accused of rape. Of course, false allegations do occur on rare occasions, but what we do know for sure is that many rapes and sexual assaults go unreported. We also know that many victims are wrongly assumed to be lying or are blamed for their attack. We also know that many men who rape women go unpunished. It's essential to talk about and address the issues that women face and men face, which could save lives, but we need to find a way to do it that isn't at the expense of women. And in its peddling of hatred towards women and its absence of solutions to the problems that men face, its activism lets everybody down, including men. Great, thank you. Okay, so if you heckle, I just won't take you in the questions, so that's the deal that we've got. Great introduction. Thank you so much. Kicked things off brilliantly. Um, Peter. Wow. Well, thank you for that warm introduction. <laughs> it's interesting. As part of my uh, preparation for this, I was speaking to Queen Camille Parlier last night at the bar. And uh, I, had a, I had a revelation. I realised that not only is Camille one of the world's greatest thinkers, she's also one of the world's greatest drinkers. And so if I'm a bit green around the gills today, please accept my apologies. But uh, the important thing was that she totally gets it. She gets the men's rights movement, which is interesting because a lot of people don't. If you speak to many feminists, you will hear a familiar mantra that men are privileged, always, always have been, always will be, and that women are victims, always have been, always will be. But the data, which is empirical and impartial, is, paints a very different, inconvenient picture. Uh, we pay the most taxes, we get the least state support, we've become an educational underclass, and we have a record high suicide rate. We're also more likely to be homeless, attacked, jailed, drafted, denied parental rights, and uh, shafted by divorce courts. And on top of that, as if that wasn't enough fun, we also die years, years earlier than we need to because of the life expectancy gap, which has grown 90% in, in, in 100 years. And that's because, not because men don't go to the doctors, but because the NHS spend millions and millions and millions of pounds on women's healthcare, which is great, but they don't spend hardly anything on men's healthcare, which is surely not equal. Despite all this, there is fierce, sometimes violent resistance to the suggestion of a men's minister, or marking International Men's Day in Parliament. We saw this with Philip Davies, MP, recently. Uh, when, when he mooted the idea of having a, a debate in Parliament, Jess Phillips laughed at all of the aforementioned problems. Apparently, that's funny. And so this is precisely why we need menonism, or, as I prefer, being a suffragette. Despite 50 years of feminism being the political and social status quo, it hasn't done anything to address any of the aforementioned issues. It doesn't touch them. It doesn't care. And that's because the patriarchy theory, which is just a theory, it's not a fact, paints men as the aggressors, as the opponents who must be defeated. So why on earth would feminists want to help them? This means that men, I take no joy in saying this, but it's the truth, Men who support feminism are turkeys voting for Christmas. Now look, this doesn't mean that the men's movement is misogynistic, as Lydia suggested it is. As many people suggested it, it's very easy to go into forums, the dark corners of the internet, and quote mine and find vile comments from vile people, or conflate the actions of mentally ill people like Elliot Rogers with people like me who 
that's largely sane. It's simply about men being active and trying to address some issues. Uh, one of my all-time favorite things about the men's movement, which a lot of people conveniently ignore, is that it's heavily populated with women. There are amazing women in the men's rights movement. Uh, Camille Parlia, Christina Hoff Summers from the American Enterprise Institute. Cassie J, a film director, she's just made a film called The, uh, the Red Pill. Erin Pizzi, you were talking about the domestic violence issues. Erin uh, Pizzi was famously ousted by the feminist movement. She was given threats. She was forced to leave the country because she refused to uphold the dogma that only men are violent and all women are victims. So, yes, we do need menonism. We do need men's rights. But men's rights doesn't need to be at the expense of women's rights. And all I would say is, you know, you don't take my word for it. You can take Camille Parlier's word for it too. It's, uh, I, I like the idea that we could all just work together with like a slightly universalist approach than this divisive, gender-baiting propaganda that we hear all the time, which is quite, clear, quite clearly from the last 50 years getting us nowhere. Thank you very much, Peter. Angela. I think um, it's, it's possibly more uh, useful to think of the men's rights movement in terms of where people within it are coming from philosophically. Because if we get into, um, you know, sort of he said this and then he said that kind of stuff, um, a lot of the time people who speak online are going to be incoherent. Um, so I think thinking of it in terms of the broader kind of principles is useful. So for example, um, I'm a feminist, but I would absolutely unequivocally support um, every and all uh, goals of the men's rights movement that seek uh, equality before the law. I mean, to me, it should be kind of self-evident. For example, in the family courts, um, I don't see any reason why feminists or people who regard themselves as progressive on gender would not support the men's rights movement, uh, particularly in, in, in the family courts because of the fact that you know, historically, it was feminists who said, um, you know, women are not exclusively, um, you know, destined by biology or God to be to be the caretakers um, and to raise children. Um, so it's completely incoherent uh, of them to um, try to stop in some way a father from actually trying to be part um, of uh, of the family. Um, so I support all of that. I have absolutely no problem with that. Lydia mentioned the online stuff. Now, I've written about that a bit, but I accept that you have to make a distinction between the people who are making the very fair equality for the law arguments and those who are just kind of stalking people and uh, harassing people and so on. The people who are behaving in that way, I think should be more perhaps vocally condemned by those who are fair-minded within the men's rights movement because I don't accept that they're pro-free speech, for example, because they absolutely terrorize anyone who questions them. Um, uh, and uh, I just don't think they're very progressive. Um, one of the ways I think, uh, you know, elements within the men's rights movement are not progressive is that I feel they're actually mimicking the worst strands within feminism itself, because they're trying to get in on the kind of victim game. Um, I came across a wonderful piece of footage from the, the I think it's from the late 90s, and it's Christopher Hitchens, um, Naomi Wolf, and uh, a very young Katie Royfe, whose book about uh, kind of sex panic on campus, which is now uh, more relevant than ever, had just come out. And Christopher Hitchens said something that was kind of eerily prophetic, and it was this. Um, the next thing that's going, this is the next thing that's going to happen. The infantilizing that we're talking about is going to happen. Men will say, well, if a woman can go to the dean because they've been felt up or whatever, I'm going to start uh, doing it too. Everyone is going to start uh, playing the victim. Uh, men will want to share in the victimhood business, and it will be unstoppable and completely negative and very boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's a really good description of a lot of what is happening. I was also reminded of um, something kind of seemingly unrelated, but it did pop into my head when I was preparing for this, which was one time years ago I was watching uh, Question Time, and the discussion was about English national identity. And David Starkey was on the panel, and he said, uh, I might not get this exactly right because I'm just working from memory, but it was something like this. Uh, once we start having state-sponsored uh, Morris dancing and all that kind of thing, we, uh, we, the English, will be no better than the Irish and the Welsh. 
<laughs> and the reason I thought of that was because I thought, you know, uh, in some weird way, once you start sort of, and I know we're doing this right now, but once uh, men start sort of gathering around and talking about masculinity and talking about their feelings and, uh, you know, kind of essentially mimicking precisely what a feminist meeting is like, uh, kind of the game is over in some way. Um, stoicism is kind of part of the package of masculinity. And I would also say it's, it's actually a very positive trait of masculinity, which all the women I admire and all the women who made feminism happen were actually, um, you know, embodying in some way. Um, not just stoicism, but all the other kind of uh, masculine virtues, physical bravery, strength, you know, um, all of the women I admire, Bernadette Devlin, uh, Jermaine Greer, um, you know, that's the kind of spirit in which they actually brought about really positive changes for women. And I just think, um, uh, let's not leave those great masculine virtues just to the men. I think we should um, uh, sort of raise everyone up by actually, um, you know, uh, making people stronger rather than uh, expanding um, the kind of, uh, the, the very negative uh, cult of victimhood that we see emerging that I think is actually extremely negative for women and I think it will also be very negative for men. Thank you very much. So, so, Peter, how do you respond to this charge, really, that men, the men's rights movement isn't actually that masculine? And uh, it's not very stoical, not very sort of... It's a sort of forum for complaining and victimhood. And Well, I mean, if you take the question of the debate literally, the title of the debate literally, I mean, the men's rights movement, like anything in, in life, isn't perfect. There is a slight tendency to err on victimhood, I suppose. And men aren't always brilliant at coalescing and working together because men like to achieve individually. They like individual merit. That's kind of how we're hardwired. Um, but on the whole, I mean, I think what Angela said is a very nice romantic sales pitch of, of, of what feminism is. And I wish it were like that. I'm sure I know aspects of it are like that. But there are also, I mean, if you look at the Women's Equality Party, which is without a doubt the political manifestation of modern feminism, it actively opposes in its manifesto against 50-50 shared parenting. So it's divorced from reality to say that feminists want men to have equal rights to, the, to, to their children and not just finance them. That's just not true. And it hasn't been true. That's why the family has been deconstructed over the last five decades and why we're in this mess now. Um, Lydia, do you, do you see anything in the idea that feminists and uh, particularly the contemporary feminism can be quite demonizing of certain men, you know, presenting men as inherently threatening. Often the narratives that they create around issues like domestic violence and rape can be... Do you, do you see any problematic trends within that? Or? I'm sure there are... So within the feminism movement, there are certainly strands which, um, you know, are inappropriate and say inappropriate things about men and women. But I think the problem we have is that we assume um, that feminism is one overarching... Uh, sort of sphere and actually there are so many different subparts and and you know and that represents a very very small minority of actual feminists who just want things like equal pay you know they want uh, you know equal representation in politics and actually yeah of course as, as with any sort of human rights movement you're going to get the few sort of strands which but they don't represent the entire movement as a whole but you're saying the exact opposite about the men's movement well i'm saying about the men's movement is there are more men who are, you know, a part of the men's movements, they're men's rights activists, who spend their time trolling women and attacking women than actually fighting for the issues that men do face. So, and it's unfortunate that these men, these uh, men's rights activists, they tar the entire movement. Angela, can I just bring you in on this question of what is contemporary masculinity? Because you hinted at the idea of stoicism and uh, individual strength resilience. Is that something that we should be defending? Because a big strand of the discussion around men at the moment is around men's mental health, for example, and the idea that closing off can be very bad for you. Do you think, what kind of model of masculinity should we be defending, or should we not defend any at all? Well, I guess uh, where I was going with the David Starkey thing was kind of more like, uh, it's almost like once you start talking about it, you know, it, it, you're already, it's already kind of over in a way. I don't see why we can't, uh, both in terms of femininity and masculinity, be critical of those elements um, that we think are sort of uh, categorically, you know, negative, um, without kind of throwing out the whole thing. Um, 
so I guess I was sort of picking out the, the masculine virtues that I think are very positive for everyone, uh, you know, and I, I, I think, you know, that they're admirable kind of traits. Um, but um, all the stuff about, you know, stoicism is a problem because men have high, high suicide rates and everything, um, you know, um, men are talking about their feelings more than ever now. So if the suicide rates are higher and men are talking about their feelings more, doesn't that kind of tell us that maybe talking about the feelings isn't the way to solve these problems? Um, I mean, and it's actually deeply conventional because the whole uh, dominant ideology is about therapy culture now, you know? Um, it's all about kind of, and it's, I think it's a sad thing that, uh, um, that in a way the men's movement kind of has to compete on those terms, you know, in order to, as Christopher Hitchens was kind of alluding to, kind of, get, you know, get in on, on the game of kind of showing how much you're suffering and, you know, talking about your feelings and so on. I mean, I absolutely accept what Peter was saying, that um, my description of feminism is not actually how feminism is. That's absolutely true. I guess I was saying the, in the history of feminism, because it has all these different strands and it is kind of a broad church, the bits that I would take influence from and admire are, mm -hmm. are like that. But it's absolutely true that um, uh, that all those things that you describe are unfair. Um, and, um, and, and certainly at least, you know, and I actually don't think that they're very good for women. Um, I mean, the example I gave of, of the family courts, um, I mean, you cannot say there's nothing I inherent about uh, women that makes them exclusively able to care for children and then say, but they should be privileged in the family courts to be the care of children. So there's all that kind of stuff that I completely agree with. You know, I think feminism has to be reformed and, and I wish uh, was more open to debate kind of internally. Uh, unfortunately, it really isn't. Um, uh, I have a feeling that that's changing, but I could be wrong. I mean, ultimately, it's not really in the realm of fact. I'm just saying these are the things that I admire. Peter, but just as a side note, I, heard a, I asked a question about the male suicide <laughs> rate because I thought that would be really concerning if there was more um, men killing themselves now than there used to be. And I, so I asked a question about it in the debate yesterday, and apparently the reason why suicide is now the leading cause for killing young men is because they're not dying of anything else. So they no longer die in wars or in factory accidents. The rate has stayed the same, but they're just not dying of other things. Um, so if you could also say that suicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women, it's just that pregnant pregnancy care has got so much better they're not dying during pregnancy no no uh, uh, but so what so the, the, the reason i raise that is that a lot of the reason why feminism gets a hard time is because they spin problematic statistics and i'm on board with you with that that a lot of what they say about um really difficult complex issues are, are reduced to uh, misinformation but aren't the men's rights activists frequently just as guilty of cultivating the sense of victimhood through misinformation and and dodgy statistics, quite frankly. I mean, I'm sure there are examples of that. I'm not saying that the men's movement is, is flawless, um, but it has to be extra careful to substantiate data and fact check. And it's easier than ever to do that. I mean, if you look at the factual feminist, Christina Hoff Summer does a fantastic YouTube series that I recommend you all see. If you haven't already, she's an amazing woman. She's one of my political heroines. Uh, and she's wonderful. She takes a scalpel to all of these issues. And she, she uh, you know, unveils all of the lies and misinformation which have become folklore now, a very, very lucrative folklore. And, and going back to the, the suicide rate, I mean, it always makes me laugh when people say, oh, if, if only men spoke about their feelings more, there'd be less suicide. Are you kidding me? If men, spoke about, if men speak about their feelings, they're mansplaining, or, you know, they're being big babies, or, you know, if they're real, they've got man flu. Men cannot win. Well, I'm not sure that's true, because there is massive, a massive explosion of awareness around men's health and men's mental health specifically. Uh, you know people are taking it seriously because Lad Bible <coughs> ran a campaign around uh, mental health. They had this enormous uh, anti-suicide campaign. Uh, there's an innumerable, and it's almost what Angela's saying, men are encouraged endlessly to talk about what they're feeling, endlessly to, to, to disclose their, their inner emotions. And so I just don't recognise the world you're talking about well, well organisations like Calm do some great grassroots work around suicide, and, and there are lots of uh, you know other grassroots organisations that do that. But if you look at the government, and when it comes to money, what the government actually spend on preventing uh, male suicide and putting interventions in place, pardon my language, it's fuck all. They don't do 
anything, if this were women dying at a 15-year high of suicide rates, people would be foaming at the mouth, and rightly so. The Guardian would be bending over backwards to be writing about it. There would be campaigns at every corner. We'd never hear the end of it. When it happens to men, it doesn't matter because male life is cheap. Okay, so... I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna come out. To, I'm just gonna give Lydia a quick minute to, to come back on anything she. Yeah, she I'm making like. myself really popular here. I know. I can tell. <laughs> well, I think you've, I think we've got a really good split in the room. So, Lydia, do you want to come back on anything, and then I'll come out to take questions. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to point out is that you know you're talking about a very, very serious issue, and I agree. Karma doing amazing work. There are definitely groups that address these issues really well. Um, but even just saying, oh, if this was women, we'd be doing this, or if this was women, it's like, actually, we should be concentrating on men and the problems that men face. Yeah, but I was just highlighting the, the contrast in, in attention and finance that's given. And I, I mean, I don't actually think it's true. I think, you know, a lot of people are talking about these issues. A lot of men and women are talking about these issues. The media is certainly talking about these issues. Obviously, some papers more than others. But um, I would sort of point out that you know you've got uh, you know you've got this movement that's growing and growing but it's a modern movement it's it's only been in the last few years when we've actually been like hey this is a really big issue and it's um, you know there are more men taking their own lives and you know actually we need to talk about it but if you know we're saying that oh people are talking about it but it's only been in the last few years so i mean in 50 years time if we continue to be on this sort of progressive movement of discussing our problems men seeking more um, you know help for their mental health issues, then in 50 years' time, we might see that the male suicide rate actually goes down. Well, okay, well, well, sorry. well, well. <laughs> we're going to come out uh, because obviously people want to speak. So I'll take some down the front, starting here. Two blunt questions, probably going to make me unpopular with everyone on the panel. Right, on suicide, this, this statistical point has not been grappled with. That there's something positive about the biggest cause of death in a certain proportion of the population being suicide because people are ending their lives prematurely because nothing else is ending their lives. But even say that wasn't the case, I don't think that uh, uh, arguing that society must be organised a certain way so as to avoid people committing suicide, I don't think that flies. That's moral blackmail. I wouldn't accept it from men's rights people. I wouldn't accept it from the trans lobby. I wouldn't accept it from people on disability benefits. We must do X, otherwise X people will kill themselves is a non-starter. It just doesn't wash, sorry. And on the other side of the coin, uh, you know, we're we're, it's asserted that uh, all sexual assaults tend to go unreported. Well, that's a logically incoherent statement. Let's break it down. What you mean is that people are, are being, claiming to one lot of people they've been sexually assaulted and that they haven't reported it to the first lot of people. And then that claim is being taken as good coin. It makes no sense. If, 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 if a proportion of sexual assaults were going unreported, you wouldn't know about them and you wouldn't be able to make that assertion. And I don't think you should be taking that claim as good coin. Thank you very much. In general, I believe in like, gender equality as a whole. I don't like saying feminism or meninist. I, just, I feel like it separates the two genders too much for my liking. But I was going to ask just a few questions, not for my personal opinion, just to like, see what I, want, what, what I want people to talk about. And... Um, what I was going to ask is, he, um, there was a, like, toxic meninist were brought up, like, there are certain people, and then he brought up an organisation of feminists and, like, the problems with that. If Lydia could bring up um, some organisations or groups that are, like, are misogynist or whatever you want to claim. And um, as for statistics that were brought up about suicide, I don't think um, the main, like, disadvantage that um, could cause... Um, uh, meninism is statistics. I think it's something to do with societal views on men as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like as in, like if a man, if a man was like crying or something like that. Just in general, I'm not saying everyone here believes her, but in general, society would see it as like um, just like the, not the right thing to do. Or if a woman hit a man and a man started like crying, do you, do you know? Do you understand the gist I'm getting? Yeah. Like, just how yeah, society great. has a general view. Perfect. Thank you. Great contribution. Thanks. Hi, I'm Steve Moxon, author of the uh, Woman Racket. I've written several research papers about domestic violence, right? uh, and it's women researchers, uh, Christine Cross and Campbell, they've found that in a couple contexts, the preferred mode of aggression of girls and women is physical violence. The same researchers in other studies have found that in any situation where a female will be the target, 
um, men, nor men back off. Uh, Louise Dixon, who's a forensic psychologist at Birmingham University, uh, she's found if you factor together, if you assume equal race of perpetration, male and female, and the other way around, you would expect from a combination of female frame weakness and male upper body strength a 20 to 1 uh, factor, tw 20 times as many injuries sustained in domestic violence by women. In actual fact, all the data shows that it's either parity or with severe injury, it's actually more males. We know that males underreport by about a fact, up to a factor of 10. So the problem is the reason why men's activists actually attack feminists is the core problem uh, is, is actual serious misinformation uh, but by feminists. And this goes back to the whole roots of identity politics. So that's why there is this clash. It's, it's, the problem is not asserting, as quite rightly you're saying, men talking about things doesn't get him anywhere. But the problem is, if you're a man and you're assaulted by a woman, you get arrested, you get charged, you lose your house, you use your contact, even though you're the victim. Now, that is a massive, massive problem. And I could go to other areas like, obviously, false yep. allegations of rape, etc. I know. Ones. I just have a problem with this massive pity party that's going on here, um, kind of on both sides of the movement. I mean, on one hand, it's... Yes, of course women have always been... You can't argue that women haven't been at the bottom of the pile. You, you honestly can't. <laughs> you can try. Um, but also it's, it's sort of the, oh, no, um, women did this to us, so we're the victims now. It's, it's the victimisation problem that I have a massive issue with. Being, arguing that either side is the victim is not going to help anything. And I find just this, this group of feminists who... I. I Personally, I think that you can't say you can be a feminist wrong. I think that's a poisonous idea. I think if you believe in gender equality, you are a feminist. Saying that you are doing feminism wrong is absolutely poisonous. If this is uh, about men's like, uh, rights, and I would like to see another man maybe neutral on the stage, yeah. it's disproportionate. Yeah. And the moderator doesn't count. Even though you're a man, you don't count because you're not the one debating. You're moderating. Right? My other thing is... Uh, I still count. I, I know you count. <laughs> I, I, know, I know. You know what I mean. Um, I'm curious where Lydia got the... You guys were going back and forth saying some women are, are like not, pro, like not good in the movement. And then you say proportionately, or like kind of more men uh, assert themselves or act poorly. How do you get that proportion? How do you come to that conclusion? That's from my personal experience. So, so it's... Yeah, it's from just, the men's rights... You're, Activists How you feel? that I've encountered online, you know, spoken to, a lot of it has been quite aggressive and vicious and actually hasn't addressed, as I said, the issues and that we've talked about. Um, but I will argue that, obviously, as in all movements for human rights, you know, whether it's feminists or, you know, meninists, maybe you want to call them, um, there are definitely some people who misinterpret what... Um, you know, feminism or men's rights are. And oh, so instead just, of... We're going to come back to the panel, but just... And one last yeah. really quick yeah. thing. Why are the men, like, centre stage? Did, was that planned or the... <laughs> we're just asserting our no, sort of phallic I, 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 masculinity. I'm just curious. It was, like, was it labelled or... I just want to know. I, I, no. I, I don't think they wanted me to have an easy escape. I, I think that's yeah. what it was. I don't enjoy sitting next to him. <laughs> I'm going to try and be as calm as I can because I don't want to come off as an angry feminist, but obviously if you made the same anger, that would be fine. But what I want to say is that um, when you're talking about, so when you're talking about um, suicide rates and all of this, the people that I've heard speak most about this have been feminists, not meninists, because the thing is, is that the problems that feminists are trying to um, diagnose in society and trying to change affect men as well as women. So when you're talking about like men not being able to talk about their feelings, and when they do, they're called big babies, that's because when you're emotional, that's associated associated with being feminine and that's a weakness so that's a man being weak when you're highlighting all of these things you're not looking at the causation of where that's coming from you're highlighting it and then saying yeah but that's just like a random thing that has nothing to do with what feminists are talking about like I think what was highlighted that um, you kind of dismissed is that each time you've spoken about a problem that a man faces you have to bring in feminists and that's all I've ever heard from meninism and from men's rights activists they can't talk about men's problems without talking about feminists on the other hand what have meninists actually done to progress men's rights that feminists haven't tried all i see is that men's rights activists are trying to be angry at feminists i don't know who they're angry at or why they're trying to stand in the way of feminism who are trying to progress problems that affect both genders because they don't like fem being on the front of feminism great thank you i'm going to come Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the panel, starting with Angela. 
Well, the gentleman that was asking about why, you know, about the, the, the balance on the panel, um, there's a thing going around now called Manal Watch, and it's all about uh, male-dominated panels. If this was about something like, uh, you know, just history or something like that, right, and it was a male-dominated panel, and a woman had stood up and said, how come there's not enough women on the panel? The kind of people, I think you would probably be annoyed by that, right? You'd be saying, you know, oh, look at them complaining, you know, these feminists complaining. So the thing is, like, I mean, um, you know, what, kind of what, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what, what we do at that, because it's not fair to say, you know, if, if it's already happening, if feminists are already, you know, do, doing those kinds of campaigns, then it's kind of almost like the only thing that uh, men uh, uh, who uh, have an issue with the feminist movement can do is to copy them and start doing exactly the same stuff. Um, so that's kind of what I, I was thinking um, about this kind of all along. It seems like the only way that uh, men can catch up is to actually mimic whatever it is that feminists are doing, but uh, obviously reversing the genders. Um, so it seems to me the problem is that it's almost like there's a set of values that are dominant, and they're not very, uh, they, they, they don't sit along nicely beside the, the traits of masculinity. You know what I mean? Regardless of whether those are acted out by a woman or a man. Um, it seems like masculinity is the thing that, that, uh, that is sort of unfashionable. Um, and the only way in which men can uh, feel they can progress is by, in a way, being less masculine. Yeah, great, good point. Uh, Peter. Um, to the young lady at the back, uh, I, I wasn't dismissing the reasons for suicide. On the contrary, I think that one of the biggest reasons for male suicide isn't because blokes aren't talking about their feelings. I think it's because they live in a culture where masculinity is, and I'm not exaggerating, I quote, it's branded as toxic. That is not healthy. Who wants to live in an environment like that? Nobody would talk about any other social demographic in that way. They wouldn't talk about Muslims in that way. They wouldn't talk about Jews in that way. They wouldn't talk about gay people in that way. And yet men are all of these things as well. So when you combine that with the systematic resistance to men, I'm talking about you know, in terms of policy and law, these things combine to make a deadly combination. And, you know, in terms of saying that meninists and men's rights activists haven't done anything to effectuate change, that's just not true. I mean, Mike Buchanan has just started a grassroots political party. Uh, you know, there, uh, I've personally written a book and put my, put my neck on the line. You know, there are people out there like Martin Daubney, who was speaking in Parliament. I mean, he's in the room at the moment. He was speaking at Parliament earlier this week. So there are plenty of men doing things, but sadly, they're all thwarted at the pass. Um, and, and if you really want a, a list of things to do, I can give you a list of reasons why, why men are angry at feminists. It's because they have caused the lack of fathers' rights. It's because the school system is failing boys because education's been re-engineered re to, to benefit girls. Um, the, the criminal sentencing gap. I, I have never heard a feminist question or complain about the criminal sentencing gap. In fact, when Philip Davis, the MP, brought it up, he was pilloried. He was... He was annihilated by the media for daring to suggest fact that women with the same criminal background who commit the same crimes get lighter sentences purely based on their gender. If feminists will tackle that, we'd be more than happy to support them, but they don't. I just wanted to come back to your point about um, men suffering from, you know, the branding of toxic masculinity and that men sort of disproportionately have this problem. I would argue that without wanting to play the victim card, as somebody mentioned, but femininity is just as damaging for women. You know, this femininity, the idea that a woman should have a certain job, should be at home with the family, um, you know, this, these are the reasons why they're paid less, they're not certain paid less. spheres, they're in not certain paid less. spheres they are, and, you know, why women dominate jobs that are maybe... Uh, not full time, you know, these are the problems that they face. And this is why, you know, we need to stop saying, you know, masculinity and femininity are the two sort of ideals. Getting rid of this would solve quite a lot of problems. In all of this, it, there's something that has been bothering me in the course of the discussion, um, which is that um, it's almost as if there's a third party here that we're not really talking about, and that's the state. And the thing that 
that bothers me is that, I mean, I am, a, I am a defender of men, and I'm a defender of masculinity, but there's something about men's rights that seems to, just the concept of rights, that seems to almost degrade that, because men have been the personification of, of personhood, human personhood, um, of robust personhood. And somehow, in the way that we're discussing this, um, and you can see people slipping into it, it's, it's orientated toward the state. It's, you know, well, the state isn't spending enough on this. The state isn't giving us, uh, giving us the same services. It's a demand on the state. And I think that, you know, if we want a robust personhood for both men and women, we really need to have a different starting point and not be oriented in, toward the state in, in the way that it's being posed. Great, thank you. Um. Yeah, so just going back to the toxic masculinity thing, um, I think, Peter, you've kind of seized on this phrase and kind of slightly misunderstood what uh, feminists mean when they speak about toxic masculinity. So you're talking about feminists saying, oh, the entire concept of masculinity is kind of inherently toxic. But what feminists really mean is it's a kind of set of um, expectations almost that's unrealistically imposed on men. Um, and women have the equivalent. I mean, toxic femininity is kind of, it's the expectation that's unrealistic of a kind of performative set of gender norms that's, that causes problems for people. I just wanted to hit really quickly at the kind of cultural origins of this. I mean, I wonder if the men's activist movement is kind of a, I suppose, a backlash against the sense that women have kind of increasingly entered male spheres. So, you know, there used to be clear separation where, you know, men were in the workplace, women were at home, and, you know, they had respective leadership positions in their, you know, realm of, of, of life. And so I think, you know, part of this seems to be that basically women have been able to enter every traditionally male sphere, increasingly so, so the workplace and the family, you know, women um, can now, you know, have jobs and have kids and everything at the same time. But it seems almost like men are saying, well, then the equivalent should happen for men. Um, and it, so I can kind of see how it's a bit ironic that, you know, feminism, which is dominated by women, says we've now also taken over the realm of fighting for men's rights. Because it seems like, you know, that would be, um, that would be the, the one domain, if no other, that men would be able to, you know, have the dominant say in. So I can see how, you know, basically the view that was um, said in the end seems a bit ironic, and I think that's kind of what's, you know, come through in all of your viewpoints. Thanks. Great point. Thank you. I just wanted to say one quick point about, it seems like there's two kinds of gender politics that you can see in both men's rights activism and feminism. It seems like there's oppression politics, which is about saying one gender or society as a whole is completely screwing over the other, and it needs to stop. And then there's equality politics, which says both genders should be treated equally. And they often get confused with each other. I think if you want an oppression politics, you necessarily can't treat men and women equally. Because if one gender really is screwing over the other, then the issues that face the other are just not as important. They're trivial in comparison. So if in the modern West, you know, if we're not talking about Iran, if we're talking about England, if you want an equality-based gender politics, you have to get rid of oppression narratives like patriarchy or whatever the equivalent is in men's rights, or else you can't treat men and women equally if you have an oppression narrative in your gender politics. Thank you. I've never been in a meeting, actually, where I've heard so many people say it's not fair. And I feel from both sides, and I would like to ask, in a, in a sense, who are you appealing, appealing to? So when you're saying it's not fair, it feels like a child. My children say to me, Mummy, it's not fair. He had more cake than I did. And who are you appealing to in your it's not fair mantra? Thank you. I'd just like to say about the male suicide rate thing, that women are actually more likely to attempt suicide. The techniques women use are a lot less efficient because women are more likely to use things like antidepressants to overdose on, which they don't realise that might be weaker. Hello. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate the uh, girl just there for mentioning that uh, women attempt suicide more than men 1.33 times as often. She is correct in the sense that men choose much more lethal methods. Not to stereotype, but the average female suicide attempt is to take a handful of pills, a bottle of wine, and cry herself to sleep, whereas a bloke will think, I'm going to kill myself, there's six foot of rope, there's a tree, bye-bye. Men are very much more determined, so that's one aspect. Um, but what I wanted to bring up is we uh, are talking about how uh, men's inability to open up is 
a problem that's influencing the uh, suicide rate, which is actually disproven by the fact that women attempt it more. But also that when men do try to reach out and you know, express themselves, they're shot down. Eva Wiseman wrote this piece last Halloween or the Halloween before. Um, but uh, is there anything worse than a man who cries? And the whole article was a giant shit on men who try to open up. And she mocked men for coming out and you know, looking for help. Um, and there's this great uh, other article about a young boy who attempted suicide in The Guardian, and the comments section was really quite touching. Everything I ever write about male suicide, I include it, because it was all the men saying, every time we try to reach out, people talk over us. You're a man, just get over it, carry on. You want to know why men are killing themselves so much more? It's because people, when you talk about men, you talk about them like they're shit. You mentioned, I think Peter was your name, you mentioned that... Um that the law system is like rigged against men, that men tend to get um, longer sentences for the same crime. But like, when you look at the, the judicial system, it's dominated by men. So I'm like, who are you complaining at? Because it's not, even if you do believe that feminists aren't fighting for your rights, we don't have the power to even influence the law system. So if you want to- You do. Okay, quickly, quickly, like, quickly. So if you, want to, if you want to complain about the law system, you, you need to look within yourself, you need to look at other men, because it's men that, that dominate the law system anyway. So. Okay, thank you. One thing I've noticed today is just how kind of adversarial the whole debate is. I've never heard of Mananism before today, but that just seems like a new way to polarise the debate, uh, the sort of the problems between men and women. But actually the things we've been talking about, suicide, toxicity all the kind of problems are actually down to personality and we tend to generalise by gender. So do you think we'll get to a point one day where gender politics will end and we'll all learn how to share the pain together and celebrate our differences? How would you take what will be seen by today's children in all education, early years, secondary, university, how will you take the sophisticated language that you're using and explain to a four-year-old, you still can't hit a girl even if it's in self-defence? Okay, uh, how would you take that and explain it to children who ask the most honest questions, who are not talking from personal experience, they're asking very honest questions. How would you argue what you've argued today to children? Thank you very much, and I'm afraid we're out of time. So I'm going to let the speakers sum up for two minutes each, starting with Angela. One part of this discussion has been, um, uh, well, the main thread running through it has been really about equality. Um, but we have to distinguish between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome because a lot of the time those two things simply can't go together because if you want to achieve equality of outcome for one group, it normally means discriminating against the more dominant group um, in order to achieve that. Feminism and as well uh, men's rights have to be clear about um, whether they're looking for uh, equality of opportunity or equality of outcome. I entirely support all attempts um, to create equality of opportunity. Uh, once you get into equality of outcome, um, it gets an awful lot more messy. I just wonder if, um, uh, if the only way men, biological men, can actually achieve equality is, is by ceasing to be masculine, because it seems like the real war is not on men per se, it's on masculinity. Um, and that also includes, it can be seen within the feminist movement where all elements um, that don't conform uh, to the current kind of tendency towards the cult of suffering and victimhood are also being purged, um, as we've seen with Jermaine Greer and lots of others. Um, all of these things are being purged from the feminist movement and they're being purged from everything else. Um, so m men's rights and feminism is just one expression of what I think is a broader kind of ideological project. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, to the person at the back who's talking about the legal system. Um, yes, there may be more men in the legal system, although there are plenty of women making these decisions as well. But the reason why men are tending to get longer sentences is because the women's movement, the feminist lobby, has huge sway and influence. And that's why this has happened. I mean, we still see to this day, despite all the claims for advocating equality, campaigns incredulously to close women's prisons. What? That's absolutely bonkers. Um, and, you know, but it's, of course, men in the legal system also blame as well because they're being chivalrous with their equality. They're saying, oh, well, you know, we and I get it, there's a natural tendency to be protective of women and perhaps be gentlemanly about these things. But I think we're at an age now where chivalry and politics shouldn't coexist. 
in terms of gender politics, I would love in the future for there to be no feminism and no meninism. It would be really wonderful if we could just all get together, you know, the risk of sounding like John Lennon and, uh, you know, sort these things out. But unfortunately, it's too lucrative. It's financially and politically lucrative uh, for the women's movement. Um, and, and, that's, and that's why the whole domestic violence industry, as Erin Pizzi will tell you, she's in my book, I quote her, I quote Camille Apalia in the book, it's, it's a lucrative system and it's been, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's become a cash cow. And uh, in 30 seconds, what would I tell a child about not hitting people? I don't know, I'd probably say not to hit anyone, ideally. But, um, uh, but I always come back to the same thing. I, women are equally capable, of course, but they're also equally culpable. So let's hold everyone to the same standards, I guess. Lydia. When we talk about equal rights, um, we're really talking about sort of equalizing where issues aren't equal. Let's make it simple. So, um, you know, when you're saying, you know, feminism sort of exists only as a, I don't know, to make money or as a sort of movement that doesn't actually have any influence. I mean, I completely disagree. I mean, you know, in the last 100 years, we've gained the right to vote. Um, you know, we now you know, there are more women in politics, there aren't enough, and it's not equal, but there are more, and that's a start. Um, but, you know, the problem is, we, I mean, feminism and men's rights activism, both of them, they, they definitely have a space in today's society, and they're definitely necessary. So, you know, feminism, as somebody brought up um, back there, that, that uh, it addresses both issues for men and women. And men's rights you know, it definitely has its place as long as it's actually, you know, advocating men's rights and dealing with issues that men have to deal with uh, or that it disproportionately affect men. Um, but the problem is that people misunderstand what those two uh, movements are. And, you know, then you get these sort of, you get the trolls, you get the, um, you know, people attacking each other online. And, and that actually shouldn't really be what the, what, you know, either feminism or men's rights activism is about. It should be about, you know, addressing problems that we have. But unfortunately, they exist. You know, we, it's definitely, you know, we have feminism and the men's rights activism movement. They should be positives, but unfortunately, there are definitely negatives that infiltrate. And I've seen that more in men's rights activism. Thank you very much. Can we thank our panel? Thank you.